I'm so grateful, appreciative to be here this evening to, to share the Word of God with you this evening. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and start turning to our text. It's going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I just want to tell uh, Pastor Gabe, Brother Swaggart, Miss Francis, Brother Donnie, how much I appreciate all of you. And Pastor Gabe has, has really taken us under his wing and really, really been pouring into us so much. And I really love you, man. And I appreciate you so much. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. I love our church. I love our church. Last weekend we had, for some of you that were there, we had our revival weekend over at Crossfire. It was a part of the JSBC campus days as well. And I'll tell you what, we had church Friday night, and then we had a worship night Saturday night, and the presence of God just showed up in such a, a powerful way. There is no doubt lives were changed last week. And to be a part of that, I want to encourage those watching and listening to be back with us for camp meeting. And be back with us for IYC this year in July. And we're going to have another revival weekend again in the fall or late summer, August. There's nothing fall about that in, in Louisiana. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's nothing fall about August here. But we're going to have another week weekend there in, in late August. So make your plans to be with us for those. Have you found your place here? Second Samuel, if you could, say amen. All right, Second Samuel chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. It says again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Ballet of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the Lord of hosts that dwells between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadad, drove the new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah. Uh, accompanying the ark, Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps, psalteries, on timbrels, on cornets, and on cymbals. And they came to Nacon's threshing floor, and Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen had shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. A few more verses tonight. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah and he called the name of that place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. He said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. It matters how we handle the glory of God. It matters how we carry the glory of God. And tonight I want to share with you a message simply entitled, Careful How You Carry Truth. Careful How You Carry Truth. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you so much tonight, God, and we just give you glory in this place, honor in this place, Lord, and praise in this place, Father. Lord, instill in us a reverence for truth tonight, God. Stir in us a desire, Father, to carry truth into this world around us, to proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified to this world. And God, fill us with Your Spirit as we endeavor to share the gospel with one more soul, that one more life can be changed. We're asking that You'll anoint us tonight to hear Your Word, to preach Your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It, it's interesting to me growing up, as a young man, how often throughout my life, especially in those younger ages, junior high and high school, how the trends of my life changed. Many of my friends, I grew up playing hockey, I played hockey my whole life, so so many of them, we had that in common, but as we grew up, we, we came across certain things where we really got into certain things for a season. We got into golf for a season, and we got into tennis for a season. We had a, a weird season where we, we played ping pong a lot. And oddly enough, that was the most violent thing we did. 
And when I was about 12 years old, one of the things that we got into, it became very popular in that time, and that was paintball. And my friend Joel lived at the edge of the subdivision, and behind his house was this wooded area, and there's some walking trails through there. And me and about 20 of my friends went out there, and we hung plywood on trees, and we built forts, and we fortified that place. And we made it our little arena to play paintball. And I went out and I bought a new paintball gun, and if you don't know, it uses a CO2 compressed air. And you turn up the velocity how fast you want the balls to come out. And it shoots a little ball like this, and when it hits you, it blows up, and there's a little bit of paint in it. And if you get hit, you're out. Well, my friend Kevin bought a new gun, and Kevin came there. Kevin turned the velocity up as high as it could possibly go. And then he kept going. Kevin turned the velocity up so high, he actually broke the gun. It still shot, it just wouldn't turn down. So if Kevin hit you, you were bleeding. Well, my cousin, she's about four years older than me, love her to death, my cousin Jenna, and her friend found out that we play paintball. Well, him and his friends play paintball. They thought, let's invite the young kids to come play. I said, well, come, but I'm bringing Kevin. And he's on my team. He comes to pick us up. We put all our stuff in the trunk. We drive about 30 minutes out to where their, their wooded area is. And everyone's excited. Everyone's running out the car, everyone's picking up their gear, getting everything ready. I walk to the back of the car, look at the trunk, and what I see is an empty trunk. And I looked at my brother and said, Shane, do you have my stuff? No. Looked at my other friend, do you have my stuff? No. Every person that I asked that started to dawn on me, I went to play paintball and didn't bring my paintball gun. And the guy who drove me was so gracious, he said, don't worry, man, I have an extra one. And he pulls out what looks like a dollar store squirt gun. Of comp I mean, it looked like plastic, the kind of plastic that if you squeeze too hard, it breaks. That's what he gave me. It held eight paintballs. Mine held 200. This held eight. And it was spring action, which means you can flick a paintball further than this thing could shoot one. And he looks at me, and I'm 12 years old, and he goes, don't worry, buddy, you'll be fine. I said, I'm sure I won't. You'll be fine. You guys have been playing this. I said, I shot paintballs at a tree last weekend. I'm not a Navy SEAL. I'm not going to be okay out here. And I was not okay that day. I left that day wounded, physically, emotionally, spiritually even. I left wounded. The only one there that got hit every single game. I learned something. Valuable lesson. Wish I could have learned it in an easier way. But it's a lesson every single one of us have learned at a time in our life. If you're going to go do something, it matters that you bring the right thing to accomplish that. If you're going to go play basketball, you should probably be, bring a basketball. If you're going to go play paintball, bring a paintball gun. If you're going to drive a car, bring your keys. And if you carry that over spiritually. If you think you're going to stand before God, whether it's here or at judgment day, you better be sure you're bringing the one thing that he'll accept. The only thing that God is going to accept is faith in the sacrifice of his son. There's only one thing that matters. The chapter before our text here tonight, David is anointed king over all of Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 5. He reigned in a portion of Israel, but in chapter 5, he's anointed king over all of it. And in the very next chapter, chapter 6, David says, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to reign as king, if we're going to be the nation that God wants us to be, there's one thing we have to have. There's just one thing that must be in our midst. Go get the ark. The Ark of the Covenant has its origins in the book of Exodus. As God meets with Moses and he describes what this is going to be, it's really a box overlaid with gold. And it's laid and placed in the Holy of Holies. And our TV department's awesome, and they found one of the pictures of that. If you guys don't mind putting that up for us here, so I can give you guys a visual of this. The Ark of the Covenant is essentially a box overlaid with gold, and here it is. The priest standing there. And you see the cherubim there with their wings touching and their eyes looking down on the ark. 
That piece that covers the ark is referred to and known as the mercy seat, where the priest would apply the blood. So the cherubim would look down upon the blood there. That's the outside, but Hebrews chapter 9 tells us what's inside of this. And I want to start there tonight. What's on the inside of the ark is three things. First and foremost, it's a jar full of manna. As the children of Israel came out of Egypt and almost immediately start to complain, you brought us out here to die. Isn't that amazing? How, how short term, we're, we're like goldfish, guys. How quickly we are removed from remembering what God does in our life. The plagues that they saw, the deliverance that they saw, and right when things get difficult, you brought us out here to die. At least in Egypt, we could have had a good meal before we were buried. And God says, okay, I will send fresh manna, heavenly bread, every single day for you to give you life. So the manna was life to these people. So God said, take that and put that in the ark. With that are the two tablets of stone that God himself wrote the Ten Commandments on, typifying the Old Covenant, the law. So the standards of righteousness. So we have the bread of life here in the ark. We have the standards of righteousness as these, as given in the Old Covenant, as the tablets are there. And the third thing is Aaron's rod that budded. So again, the people complain, and they complain about Moses' leadership, they complain about Aaron's leadership, and think, well, I could do that. And God says, no, bring one leader from all the tribes of Israel, and each of them carry their staff, their rod, bring it here, and we're going to bring them all into the tent. And the next day, the one person I have chosen, their rod will have budded. So overnight, Aaron's rod, which is a dead stick... It's a dead, my God, I like that. It's a dead stick. God will bring life out of death. It's a dead stick. And God says, I'll bring life here. And it buds and produces almonds. And the next morning, there is no question asked, Aaron is God's choice. And the Levites were going to be the priesthood for Israel. So that's what that typifies. That rod in there typifies the priesthood that God had chosen. So we have the bread, we have the standards, and we have the priesthood. You fast forward to the one who is to come. Jesus comes, feeds the multitude, the 5,000, walks on the water across the sea, and then they follow him. They come after him and he says, you just followed me because I filled your belly. But he tells them, Listen, how your ancestors were fed with the manna in the wilderness? That wasn't Moses, that was my father. And listen, I am the true manna from heaven. I am the bread of life. And you need to partake of all of me if you're going to keep following me. This isn't just you, you get a little bit of Jesus. You, you partake of all or you walk, walk away. And he said you need to take of my flesh and my blood. And many, John chapter 6, turned away and departed from him. John 6, 6, 6, saddest verse in the Bible, one of them. It says, many walked away from him that day. But Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He, come, he came, Galatians chapter 4 tells us, to be born under the law that he might redeem those who are under the law. So he came that he might be the righteousness of God, fulfilling the law on our behalf. The writer of Hebrews tells us that he is our great high priest. The one who can stand between God and man and make intercession for us. So watch this, the bread in the ark, the standards in the ark, and the priesthood in the ark. Jesus came and said, I am the bread of life. I came to redeem you from the curse of the law, and I will be your great high priest for all of eternity. Everything in it pointed to Christ. <laughs> then you put the cover on. And on top of it, as that image we just showed, you put the cover on, and this is where the high priest would enter in and put the blood on the mercy seat. So we're not looking down on bread, we're looking down on the blood. We're no longer looking down on a broken law, we're looking down on the blood. Not just a, a rod that typified a, a priesthood that God ordained, but we're looking at the blood. 
And this is why David said, you have to go get this. Because God said this to Moses, I will meet you at the mercy seat. Listen tonight, God will meet man at the blood. God will meet man at the blood. God will meet man at the blood. And David said, we need him in our midst, so go get the ark. 30,000 men deploy. I don't know what all the, all the uh, battles looked like then. I don't know how many people were involved, but 30,000 sounds like a lot to me. 30,000 people sent out choice men, is what the text says, to go and just to pick up what in the natural is simply a box. And they pick it up and they put it on what the Bible says is a new cart. Something we have to understand with this. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, the Ark of the Covenant is in the land of the Philistines. And they are being absolutely, God is judging them, pouring out judgment and wrath on them. And somebody finally realizes, hey, we should get rid of that. And they seek counsel, and this is their question is, how can we do this without, without disrespecting the God of Israel? That was actually their mindset. We don't want him to pour out any more judgment, so what, how can we do this in a good way? And their idea was, build a new cart. Because in the cultural norm of that time, a new cart showed respect for what you were carrying. So they built a new cart, they put gold all over it, they took two young calves that have never been used to plow the field or to carry a cart before, and they put them in front of it, and they sent it out into the land of Israel. These are ungodly heathens trying to do their best to respect a godly thing. Fast forward to our text, David's men handle it the exact same way. Listen, cultural norms does not equal God's standards. Just because it was a cultural norm that oh, oh, the nations around us put it on a new car, and that's respectful, we think that's good. What you think is good may not equal what God says is right. Our idea of good is not necessarily godly. That's always been our issue. Eve looked at the tree, and what does the text say? She looked and beheld that the tree was good, pleasant to the eyes, to be held, and partakes of it. Was it good? Absolutely not. They find themselves naked, Adam and Eve, and say, well, we need a covering. They, honestly, they're right there. What would be a good thing? Let's go out and let's give some fig leaves. That will be good. No, it won't. Abel brings his offering to the Lord and Cain comes along with him. I worked so hard for this, the fruit of the land that I toiled for and I labored for. Certainly this will be good. No, it won't. This has been since the beginning the issue with humanity, what we deem good is not equal to what God says is right. And the people say, well, this is a good thing in our culture and in our society. We'll throw it on the cart. And as they walk through the threshing floor, the ark begins to shake. And Uzzah, standing there, puts his hand out and touches the ark, and God strikes him dead. I have to be honest with you, if I were standing where Uzzah is, I'm probably doing the same thing. Two people said yes, the rest of you are more righteous than us. <laughs> if I'm standing there, I'm probably doing the same thing. I'm thinking, I don't want the ark to fall on the ground. This is the problem though. If we get comfortable with our carts, we will inevitably touch the glory. If we get comfortable with, this is how I decide is a good way to share the gospel, this is how I have deemed is an appropriate way to handle truth, then I'll get comfortable here and I'll eventually touch the glory. And I've heard people say and ask the question, is Uzzah, was that really, was that really right? I've had good intention people say, well, Uzzah, do you think it was okay? Like God struck him dead? Listen, 
It's, it's, the truth is we have, we have lost a reverence for God. When we can defend someone who blatantly rejected God's word. God doesn't owe us an explanation why Uzzah's not living. God doesn't owe us an explanation and he's not on trial. God said that this is the way that the ark would be carried. Put the poles on the shoulders of the priest and they will carry the ark. God said, this is how it's to be done. Man disregarded it and experienced judgment. That is not God's problem. That's man's. And he owes us no explanation for that, nor does he have to defend himself for that. But it's the right thing. Yeah, it's the right thing. Wrong delivery. And this is what I want to present to you tonight. We can have the right thing. And if we put that on a cart of arrogance, it hinders being delivered to the people. If we take the right thing and we lay that on a cart of cultural relevance, because this is how the, the world says that we could carry truth. These are the programs that the world say are effective. These are the programs that the psychologists say are effective. No, what does the Bible say is the way to carry truth? That's what I'm interested in. I'm not trying to build carts here. And if we look at what is culturally accepted and say that is good to our eyes, what we're going to do is we're going to lay truth on what is culturally norm and we're going to find ourselves in the shoes of Uzzah. And David is broken and he takes a step back and says, stop, hold on. And it ends up at the house of a Levite, someone who understands how to handle it. And what happens? He's blessed. We today need to understand truth. God will meet you at the blood. That's the story of the gospel. He'll meet you at the mercy seat, and today he'll meet you at Calvary. For redemption and for every single thing needed thereafter, God meets man at the blood. We need that truth. But we also need to grow in how we carry that truth and mature in our carrying of that truth. And the first thing we need to establish is who is called to carry truth. Under the Old Testament, the priest carried the ark. Today, Jesus speaks to those who are following him and he says, you shall be my witnesses. You are going to take the truth of the gospel to the world. Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and says, this promise is to you, to your sons, to your daughters, and to those afar off. Meaning, it's not a first century church thing. God has called those who have been born again to take the gospel to the world. Those who've been redeemed to take the gospel to the world. So who is responsible to carry truth to the world? You and me. Every single one of us. You agree with me tonight? Amen? Okay. How? How? The book of Acts is really our roadmap to the growth of the church. And it explains to us how we need to carry truth. Jesus commanded them, For truly John baptized you with water, Acts 1 and 5, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. And you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In chapter 2, it says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as as the Spirit gave the utterance. The thing that happens next, Peter gets up and preaches, 3,000 souls get saved. They're filled, they preach truth. Chapter 4, Peter, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and people and elders of Israel, and he goes on to preach, Jesus came, he lived, he died, and he's alive again. He was filled with the Spirit, and he preached truth. 
The end of chapter 4, they pray for boldness in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place they were in was shaken. Listen, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke, they preached the word of God with boldness. They got filled, they preached truth. They got filled, they preached truth. Chapter 6, choose men that are full of the Holy Ghost. Stephen is chosen. Right after that, he's arrested. Then he gets up and preaches one of the most powerful messages in Scripture. He's filled, proclaims truth. This isn't complicated. God meets man at the blood. And his method of carrying it out, be filled with the Spirit and preach truth. Chapter 9, and Ananias comes to Saul. And he says, Saul, the Lord sent me. That you might receive your vision, your sight. And you might be filled with the Holy Spirit. They eat food right after that. Amen. Next verse, immediately it says, Saul gets up and starts preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Filled. Preach truth. In verse 13, or chapter 13, Paul is full of the Holy Spirit, confronts a demon-possessed man, and the people there are astonished at his doctrine. A man who's filled proclaims truth. Get filled, preach truth. And after that, get filled up again and preach truth. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit and preach truth. That God's Spirit may convict people. That God's Spirit may deal with people. That we can throw out programs and... and that we can set aside all of man's efforts and understand that the heart of man needs to be touched by the hand of God to change. Let his spirit fill us up. May we depend upon that. And that the word of the Lord is enough to change a life. To save a soul and to set someone free. Be filled. Preach truth. Be filled and preach truth. This is God's method. Singers, musicians, you can make your way back. I want to close with this. My first closing. Pastor back home said that doesn't mean much. That means we're getting somewhere. I want to close with this tonight, guys, because I want all of us who've been born again would embrace and accept the reality God meets men at the blood. God's method of proclaiming the gospel and sharing the gospel is through his spirit convicting hearts. But what does that look like? The New Testament lays out several examples as Jesus, first off, speaks to the multitude. The 5,000 I mentioned earlier, Jesus preaches to them. He has compassion on them. It's the first thing. Do you know that the reason he's in the wilderness is because his cousin, John the Baptist, had just died? He literally went there to get away from people. And everyone follows him. And if I am in his shoes and I went to get away from you and you followed me, I'm not having compassion I'm not Jesus. But he looks up and sees them coming 15 plus thousand total and he's moved with compassion on them and he meets their need. Then they continue following and as I mentioned, he said, look, if you're going to keep following, you have to understand I am the bread of life and you must take up all of me. So there's a confrontation of you have to choose. When he speaks to one individual who's genuine and searching Samaritan woman sitting at a well. She says, listen, when the Messiah gets here, oh man, he's going to explain all this to us. And he lovingly leans over after bringing her sin to the surface, tells her, I am he. And she looks into the eyes of redemption. But his tone changes when he talks to the Pharisees and he says, you snakes and you vipers. And they kept saying, if you'll just tell us who you are, We'll understand and we'll believe you. And he says, okay, I'm God. And they pick up stones to throw at him. Two chapters later, tell us who you are and then we'll believe you. I'm God. All right, we're going to get our stones. And in John chapter 8, they say, just be clear and tell us. And Jesus says in the most clear terms possible, before Abraham was, I am. 
Watch this. To the multitude, he said, I am the bread of life. To the individual there hurting at a well, he said, I am that redeemer. To the Pharisees who were were hardened, he said, I am that I am. The message never changed. But Jesus' tone to the Pharisees is different than his tone to the Samaritan woman. Peter models that on the day of Pentecost to the multitude and says, you got to choose. Philip models that to the one Ethiopian who's reading the scroll of Isaiah and he says, I just don't understand. And Philip says, I got good news, brother. I can tell you who that's about. And Stephen stands in a similar spot as Jesus did and he points to the Sanhedrin and he says, you stiff-necked people, you crucified him. All three of them preached the same message, but Stephen's tone is different than Philip's when he talks to the Ethiopian. The tone to the Galatians is different than it is to the Philippians. This is what I want you to see tonight. We have to be careful that we don't talk to everyone in the body like it's Galatians 3 and 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, literally, oh, stupid ones. Some people just want to use that verse as an excuse to be mean. Like, come on. Sometimes someone's hurting and you need to get down on your knees and weep with those who are weeping. And the message doesn't change. Listen, if you're hurting, he gave his life for you. And he's not going to leave you here, I promise you this. He's going to get you back up and say, Peter, do you love me? If you love me, get up and feed my sheep. We're not staying here, but I'm going to walk with you until you're walking again on your own. There's going to be some times, though, where you've labored with someone, where you've shared the gospel with them, and somebody else has come along and starts telling them things that are not right, and you've got to grab someone by the shoulders and say, oh, you fool. But when Paul writes to the church in Rome in chapter 14, he says those who were weak in the faith or immature, some of them were still keeping feast days. And don't pull your hair out here. Paul says, let them. Is he advocating a return to the old covenant? Absolutely not. What he's doing is using wisdom to understand somebody just got saved and I'm not going to squash their faith out. I'm going to come alongside and say, hey, let's, there's a more complete understanding of the new covenant that you need to grow in. So, well, that's complicated. That's why you and I must be filled. That's why we must be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we may meet people where they are because what matters is that the truth gets to the people. And what matters is that the people get to the glory of God. Go ahead and give God praise. Tonight, you can stand with me tonight. Tonight, what is important What's important is that people grow in truth. And we must ourselves have a solid understanding of that truth. God meets man at the blood. We must grow in that. And we also must grow in maturity of us bringing that to the world and to those around us to care enough about them to meet them where they are with the same message, where they are that they might grow in Christ and grow in the Lord. So as they sing, whatever they feel led to sing here in a moment, what I want to do tonight as we leave, I want to worship God and ask two things as we pray tonight. Pray that God fill you with his spirit, that he continue to reveal in you truth, that you may grow in your understanding of the word of God and your understanding of the new covenant. But then ask him to search your heart tonight. Are there people in your life where the manner in which you're carrying the truth to them could be done better? Have you talked Galatians 3.1 to someone that you need to talk a little differently to? Or have you been a little too compassionate to someone you need to grab by the shoulders? and say, you're being a fool. Let's ask God to search us tonight. Think of those people and ask him to reveal that to us tonight, that we can apply this this week and go reach someone this week. Amen. Let's make that our prayer tonight.
slip up your hands right now just for a moment and let's just take a moment and worship him. Let's just sing about that lovely name of Jesus. Enjoy that this evening. I pray that all of us take inventory of what was said and realize that not only does everyone need to hear the gospel and need to hear the truth, but it's vital and crucial that they you do it in the right manner and the right way. Turn around and tell your neighbor you love him. Be back with us Wednesday night for our midweek Bible study. We love you. God bless you.